Go, hello. <laughs> we want to start. We, we have a plan. We're going to say a few words. I'm going to take off this mask. The music is great, but can we turn it off? <laughs> Are you going to talk about it? No, I can't hear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there are a few people who are going to talk, and, uh, and I'm going to be the first one. So usually I, I, you know, the philosopher, our philosopher colleagues, they, they write down what they say uh, because every word counts. And for us, usually that's not the case. So we usually just talk. But today I thought that maybe I should try to make every word count, so I'm gonna read. Uh, so, okay, um, there's this ship of Theseus that we all heard about. Noam kind of said things that were related to it towards the end of his conversation with speakers, but it, okay, so some say it reveals uh, difficult questions about the metaphysics of identity. From Norm, we learned that these are simply questions about the theory of meaning. What is a ship? What is a city? What is a river? What is a building? As we all know, Building 20 was, was destroyed and rebuilt on the grounds we're, sitting on, we're standing in along with the chomsky Halley office. Uh, yeah, um, it was renamed and renumbered, but that's a minor detail as relevant to semantics as uh, you know, the Roman conquest is relevant for the nature of UG. And okay, so uh, what is a person? You lose a tooth, are you the same person? Uh, you get all your blood replaced, are you the same person? You learn something new, forget something, lose someone you love, are you the same person? Although the questions uh, might seem very difficult, the intuitions are fairly clear. And yet, um, there are some people who insist that there are two different people the person they were before they met Morris and Norm and the person they are now. So go figure. You thought eh, these deep, deep questions are too hard. When you came to MIT, they became way harder. Eh, what do we learn from all of this? I'm not quite sure, but what I know is this. If it ever made sense to name something at any university over after anyone, it was the naming of this historic hall way after Norman Morris. Okay, but you know, I don't deserve credit for this. It was uh, David's decision when, uh, when Athulia and Martin had to occupy this space that we, that we called the Chomsky Halley Suite informally. It was supposed to be the Chomsky Halley lab, but as we thought about it, we said it's got to be bigger than a lab, and it was indeed the entire hallway, and um, you are encouraged to go and visit. If you want to, you just sign up, and we can take you on a tour. In any event, the people who really uh, deserve thanks here are primarily Athulia, Martin, and Jen, who did all of the work and there's so much thinking involved and we'll hear about it. They did it together with uh, Paul Monti and Imur Gerland. So Paul Monti is the designer and Imur Gerland is from the Office of Communication. And of course, there's Mary without whom, you know, as we know again and again, nothing here happens and Chris and, you know, everybody else in the office. So, so thank you. Yeah, so we, we wish we could have had the event upstairs, but that was difficult. And so, so that's, that's it for now. Uh, you know, we know that uh, we can't have anything of significance without Jay talking. So Jay, please. Thank you. 
Uh, let me begin uh, by uh, congratulating Noam and Valeria on this uh, historic occasion uh, in their home in Tucson, Arizona, the city where um, in 1956, Ken Hale was crowned bull riding champion at the University of Arizona Rodeo, a great city. I wanna thank Danny uh, for Fox for making me a part of this memorable event and Mary, Grenham and Chris and Tanela for making it possible for me to greet all of you so easily. I wish I could be there in person, but that will have to wait a bit. It would never have occurred to anyone to memorialize a Chomsky wing of the department or a Halley wing. Of course, it had to be both. We take it for granted, the pairing of their names. We think of them the way we think of Castor and Pollux, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, Porky and Bess, Penn and Teller, or the Captain and Tennille. They to go together like love and marriage and a horse and a carriage. And I'd like to say a word about why that is so. I first met Morris in Building 20 in the fall of 1962. It was friendship at first sight. We remained fast friends for more than 56 years. I had met Noam in the spring of that same year on the steps of Widener actually, and he and I have been friends for 60 years. So I've had ample time and occasion to observe the deep respect and affection that each held for the other. For Noam, Morris was the engine behind the success of the new field. For Morris, it was the other way around. Together, they accomplished something very rare in the history of science. They changed the way we look at ourselves. In that respect, they join a very exclusive club with members like Newton, Darwin, Freud, Einstein, and Niels Bohr. For many that may sound overblown, but I think I will be on the right side of history. I didn't think for all their marvelous individual gifts, each could have done it without the other. I think it to be one of the most fortuitous moments of intellectual history that their paths converged the way they did. When I wrote Noam about the circumstances of their meeting, this is what he wrote back. I entered Harvard in fall 51, very quickly made it to RLE down the street, met Morris, who was working at the lab on speech analysis, where Carol got a job through Haskins Connections. We, of course, started talking about linguistics, disagreeing about everything, American structuralism versus Jakobson's Prague linguistics. I went home and thought about it and realized that though I didn't think his arguments were compelling, his intuitions were right. Not for, the first, not for the last time. Within a few days, we were close friends and collaborators from then on, along with Eric Lennonberg, then also a Harvard grad student and Yahushua Bar Hillel on his periodic visits. If we think of the foundation of the generative enterprise as a three-legged stool, this dedication names two of those legs. I would like to suggest that the third leg is Building 20. It was erected in December 1943 as a temporary structure to house research on microwave radar during World War II. It was supposed to come down six months after the war ended. That would have put its demise at February 15, 1946, half a year after the Japanese surrender. 53 years later, the building was still standing. Building 20 was a gray as best decided wooden structure whose windows you could actually open yourself. The floor joists were strong enough to hold metal presses. The inner walls were movable. The office bays could be reshaped with the ease of a Lincoln log toy. It was a building whose flexibility harmonized with an attitude of mind that characterized the scientific thinking going on inside it. Be ready to change your point of view at a moment's notice. Now here's a picture of building 20. I wanna show it to you. Can you all see it? 
This is a painting made from a photograph in Christmas 1990 by Anne Marie Sobin, Nick Sobin's wife. Every time I entered the building, I went up these stairs. I went up those stairs to those doors. My office was right there. And as a remarkable coincidence, when Building 20 was destroyed, I happened to be on the walk outside, which is about 20 yards this side of the building's face there. And I actually saw the wrecking ball go through my office. It was a ball swinging on a huge crane and it shattered the office and turned it into splinters. And I think that's when my heart was broken. That's when I really left MIT. When that uh, building, when that fall went through those windows. When one thinks back over the history of MIT, there are a multitude of extraordinary achievements to point to. But to my mind, only two of them belong at the top of science's Parnassus. One of them is the development by Ray Weiss and his colleagues at LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. From an experimental point of view, this development will be as important to the future of astronomical physics as the Galilean scientific revolution has been to science. I say that because prior to LIGO, everything we know about the universe has been based on optical data, but only about 5% of the universe is visible. Ray Weiss and his colleagues have added a whole new dimension of discovery, sound. The second achievement is the development of the generative enterprise, which offers a whole new dimension on understanding what it means to think. What do these two achievements have in common? They both emanated from Building 20. The linguistic part of the story is being memorialized here this evening. This is what Ray Weiss wrote to me about the second achievement. All the work in the beginning of LIGO in 1971 to the day we were evicted from the building when they began tearing it down was done in Building 20. We also did the work to show the cosmic background radiation was a thermal spectrum using balloons and then the COBE satellite in Building 20. I'm glad you will remind people about the building. Building 20 represented the old soul of MIT. Alas, that MIT is gone. The end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st has subjected the campus to a queer eye for the straight guy makeover that is breathtaking. Its buildings win prizes. San Francisco look alike rubber wheel trolleys filled with camera toting tourists stop in front of them. The tourists have even begun to invade the halls of the Institute. They make their way to the president's office to peep in. They open the doors of laboratories for look-see. Artsy photographers sell odd angled internet photographs of the building you are all standing in right now. Who would have thought it possible? Well, times change. And I'm chagrined to say that I didn't change with them. I drew the line at Building 20. Ray ended his note to me this way. No place like Building 20 exists anymore. What made it so valuable was the ease of accidental encounters with really interesting people. Architects should learn something from this. Let me end with a benediction. May the memory of Building 20 inhabit the Noam Chomsky and Morris Halley wing of the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy, along with the achievement of its namesakes. Now that is a trinity to remember. Thank, thank you, Jay, uh, David. Hi, I'm David Bozetsky. Um Jay, who just spoke, he's a journal editor and it's always risky to argue with the journal editor. Um, you never win. Uh, but uh, Morris was famous for uh, saying, come argue with me. So I'm gonna argue with Jay. 
um, about the wrecking ball. Um, the hall that has this wonderful exhibit that's been added to us to, um, to uh, uh, make it the Chomsky Halley Wing, uh, that's the hall that um, for a number of years after we moved into this building, which I guess was about what, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, something, um, we would walk down when we wanted to argue with Morris or uh, find out what Noam had to say about things we were thinking about or things he was thinking about. Um, and it's uh, indeed a, a sad fact that, first of all, that it's not building 20, um, and that we cannot at this moment walk down that hall uh, to find Noam in his office, or once Bev lets us in, um, or, uh, or to argue with Morris. Um, but um, we can walk down that hall uh, to do much the same with the people who inhabit that hall now. So uh, uh, Sabine is at the beginning of the hall and uh, Adam and Donka and Michelle and, and, and Suzanne. Um, and uh, the other end uh, where I am, we have other people. Um, and what we do is we sit in our offices for much of the day. I mean, we also teach classes and those are important. But we sit in the offices, the door is open and you, you pass the door of somebody in their office and uh, as often as not, there's a student in there, um, or maybe, maybe a colleague, um, sitting across the table from one of us, and we're learning from each other and we're arguing with each other. Um, and that's something we all learn to do from Noam and Morris uh, and from the spirit of the department that they created. Um, and our department now has, you know, grand students and great grand students of Noam and Morris in it and people who were never students at MIT, but Im imbibed this way of doing science of this way of making linguistics a science, this way of teaching people and of dealing with our colleagues, which as far as I understand is was entirely the creation of Noam and Morris uh, in that corridor and the corridors that preceded it in E39 where we were in exile for five years and, and building 20 for multiple decades before that. Uh, so what I wanted to say in, in gentle disagreement with Jay is, is that your hearts should not be broken. I mean, it's, it's sad, very sad that time moves on and we can't walk down this now beautiful hallway to talk to the people who made it beautiful in a deep sense. Um, but we are all uh, Noam and Morris in our own ways and combinations of them. And what makes this department a success in, in a way what makes the field that we're in uh, so special, memorialized in this in, in the exhibit in this hallway now, um, is what Noam and Morris taught us uh, when we walked down the various hallways that over the years we had to walk down to meet with them and to learn from them. Thank you. So, uh, Tim and John Holly. <clears throat> Thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone to the semi-annual meeting of adult survivors of Sound Pattern of English. Today we are joined with adult survivors of the Minimalist program. Now, a couple of things I need, I've need i been asked to address. Anyone needing medical attention after Noam's talk, we have, uh, we have medical personnel in the back. And uh, for those of you, I don't know why people keep getting confused. The Philip Glass concert is next door. Um, so now I'm going to get to the part where all of you professors know where uh, I have taken great notes and I can't read my handwriting. So this should be familiar to just about, uh, just about all of you. Um, the main point here, uh, today is the 1st of April, which is of course, April Fools. Uh, I will uh, not dwell on the fact that that is uh, somehow uh, appropriate or inappropriate. Um, I would like to point out it is four years ago tomorrow that Morris left us. Um, and all of us still, uh, all of us still miss him every day. Um, uh, I don't know a great deal about linguistics. I honestly don't know what folks have been up to in the various buildings, particularly building 20. Um, I, I would note in the numerous times I was asked to leave my elementary school for long periods of time, I could be found running the halls of building 20 and, uh, I 
I think Morris was once asked if it was uh, if it was a bad idea to let me run around the halls of the building 20 and his response was it's made out of asbestos he can't burn it down <laughs> um, but what of uh, uh, Morris and uh, Noam although they're involved in linguistics something which as I said I don't understand very much um, I do understand friendship I've been privileged to have some lifelong lifelong friends. And I understand that uh, Noam and Morris was a lifelong friendship that defined them defined them both and and uh, is something very rare. I'm reminded of a situation at Caltech where Murray Gelman, who would be a first string physicist in any department, found himself in a department with Richard Feynman, who, you know, debatably one of the smartest people on earth. And that led to years of fights and unpleasantness. Um, Morris to Noam, whatever their various strengths have been, were a unit that worked together. And, uh, you know, that's something that, uh, that's something that pretty much anyone can understand. Let me see if I have anything else here I need to cover. No, that pretty much uh, pretty much does it. I would point out that uh, four years ago at Morris's memorial service, I used largely the same material. Uh, perhaps this is an example of the recursion that everyone has been talking about. Uh, my brother John will now speak to uh, my father's and more and Noam's accomplishments in linguistics. My brother David, not to be left out, is making book on WrestleMania, which is Sunday. Is it Killer Kowalski is the good odds? All right. John Halley. Well, I quit my job a couple of years ago teaching, so I no longer have to prepare, so I'm not accustomed to preparing, so I do not have extensive notes, but I do have a lot of memories which overlap with what's been said, you know, before. Um, yeah, I, gee, Tim spent lots of hours roaming the halls of Building 20, and so did I, and the thing I remember about it is just how much fun it was to roam the halls, but also how much fun people were having in their labs. And you could just kind of pop your head in any door and kind of look around and you would see often people engaged in intense computations on the blackboards or doing experiments on God knows what or having arguments with people. And then there was just a lot of time when you just hear laughter coming out of the rooms. And that's the thing that I most remember about Building 20 was the laughter. And that's the thing that, you know, in having been in academic institutions pretty much myself since, I found really the absence was pretty conspicuous, which is academics at least in Building 20, had lots and lots of fun. People working on problems seem to have lots and lots of fun dealing with the problems. And when that's not there, it just sort of seems to me, you ask the question, what's the point of doing it? You know, and the point was for these guys, yes, was to make progress, yes, to like advance the science, but also to have a lot of fun while you're doing it. I remember one guy who was down the hall was a guy named Jerry Leffin. Do people, does his name still resonate here? I would always go to see Jerry Leffin. God knows what he was doing with his frogs, but you know, you could always ask him. And he would tell you, which was a wonderful thing. And that was, I found that was consistent among MIT people, which is it didn't matter who you were. If you asked them, well, what are you trying to do? They would tell you. And if you didn't understand it, yes, it was possibly an indication of the fact that you don't have the background, you don't have the kind of proper approach to the subject, but often they regarded it as a challenge to themselves right, to make the material that they were doing such that a 14-year-old kid should be able to understand it. And, you know, Gletfin, I remember very much, regarded that as a personal challenge. And I remember a few years after I saw Letvin in his office there, he happened to come out to Berkeley where I was in school, and he gave a lecture. And he gave a lecture on, of all things, Leibniz. And I happened to be in the hall. 
and he held forth on this subject. And somehow I think I reported back to my father that the faculty seemed to be very outraged by what Gletfin had to say about Leibniz. So, and I was still in California, the phone rings and there is Letvin on the phone talking to a Berkeley, you know, it's like asking a Berkeley freshman, well, what was it that the faculty found so outrageous about what he said? And then I attempted to explain to him, like my zero, based on my non-existent knowledge of Leibniz, what they found to be problematic. And there we spent the next hour engaging in an argument about Leibniz, <laughs> you know, a subject which I guess I learned something about at the time. And I still remember something about Leibniz's monadology, which I then proceeded to find myself obligated to have to read up on. And, you know, I was much the better for that experience. Numerous experience. That's how I remember Building 20, having kind of random encounters with people having lots of fun, getting into some kind of argument with them, and then just walking away, like knowing a million things that, having a million questions and knowing things that you didn't before. And I think that's really what Noam and Morris's legacy ultimately was. I should just, everybody's been mentioning the dualities between, you know, various, whatever, you know, uh, uh, the, Porgy and Bess, and uh, what were you know? But the Jay, and I, I thought that Jay had stolen all my thunder. But then it occurred to me, I was thinking on the drive here how many dualities there have been. I mean, there's of course Watson and Crick, um, and there's of course now. It, but I think the one that I think with with Noam and Morris that's worth thinking about is Moses and Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, you have the lawgiver, but then you have to have the guy that's or sort of underneath that's interpreting, you know, these emanations from the divine and can present them in a form so that they can actually be understood by mere mortals. Now, I don't know if Morris actually did that. I mean, I can't make it it's heads or tails of many pages of sound pattern of English. I'll be quite upfront about that. In fact, the majority of them even though I quote from it often. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it strikes me, but, but, you know, but certainly Morris's contribution was in part creating a context where Noam's work could be disseminated and understood more broadly among the kinds of people that really should be you know, in a position to understand what he had to do. And I think that was part of, you know, Morris's you know, longstanding contribution. Uh, I guess the other duality I was thinking of is Marx and Engels, right? So the question is, well, who's the Marx and who's the Engels? Well, Morris is the Engels, of course, right? And then I guess the only other one I can think of is Lenin and McCartney. Uh, though I guess there's a little bit, who? Yeah, Kirk and Spock, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, but, but, so, but I know with, with Lenin and McCartney, well, who's the Lenin and the, who's the McCartney? I guess sir, Noam is more the Lenin and uh, Morris is a little, no, uh, well, we can uh, argue with me, <laughs> uh, right? And uh, I don't know, and then who's the last, well, I don't know, yeah, so many of them, you know, Kurt, uh, uh, you know, Johnny Rotten and Sid Vicious, uh, the, Sam and Dave. Biggie and Tupac. Well, okay, anyway, that, 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 you know. So uh, anyway, it's really great to see everybody here. You know, I, many of you people I got to know when you were at our dinner table on Thanksgiving and well, not so many of you, unfortunately, anymore, but that was pretty routine that that was our, the Morris's graduate students were kind of our second family. And uh, that's really the way it's kind of felt ever since in a way, even though I don't see them very much, I kind of feel that way about them. Anyway, it's really a joy to participate in this and I'm so glad this wing is gonna memorialize this collaboration in perpetuity. Okay, thanks. Terrific. Terrific. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Bob Berwick. I have to say this, it's an interesting experience in a dislocation kind of way because I, I was just out at Tucson 
last week talking with Noam and Valeria, and here I am back trying to talk back to them over thousands of miles. Uh, the, uh, the, so I'd like to thank the department and David and uh, Danny for inviting me to say at least a few words to uh, my friends of nearly 50 years. Uh, the other, I guess, dislocating thing is, is that uh, I too wrote down what I was going to say and astonishingly, it almost flows along the same lines that uh, Jay was talking about. And I started thinking, gee, I'm starting to think like Jay. <laughs> That's, uh, I didn't know whether that was uh, a terrific thing or not. So uh, I think it is. Uh, so I'd like to add a little bit more to the duality aspect, uh, since uh, they did together manage to change the way we think about the way human language works. And I could say uh, with a nod to Shakespeare and love that, oh, that, that's a mystery. But I think that would be a cop out. Uh, I think uh, they, they complemented each other, as people have said, almost perfectly. Uh, Mars used to say, well, I know five languages because I was kicked out of four countries. And it, it's true. And uh, if you wanted to knock on Mars's door, he would growl, you'd hear the growl and then you'd be welcomed in. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you ask Noam, he'll, he will protest that it's impossible for him to learn any you know, other language. But that's not really true. He did learn one language completely and perfectly with absolute clarity. And that's the one he talked about today, language with a capital L, the uh, interior language that's universal to all the rest of them, right? So, uh, and I think it was they, they, they played together in, a, in an especially complimentary way. And Charles Baudelaire once claimed the genius is nothing more than the ability to recover one's childhood at will. And I think that's what they did. They wandered into that awe of these questions that stand before us and they created something very new. And that fits what Morris and Noam did to a T. So together they covered the waterfront. It's just not a mystery at all. So I wanted to thank both of them for giving me the privilege of tagging along on their intellectual journey for the past 50 years, because it really truly has been a privilege to see them create a microscope, a special kind of microscope that can peer in, into the side, in, in the inside of a human mind and see what's going on. And that's really special. And I think it's an honor that we should really give to them with this commemoration that we have today. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. And now it's uh, Atulia, Jen, and Martin. Danny is, is the new chair of the department. For some of you, this may sound like a surprising turn of events. He's learned one skill already really well, which is twisting people's arms to do things. For instance, he twisted Othulia, mine, and Jen's arm to be sort of the curator of this creation of the installation that commemorates or as a known, and we have no business doing this. We are the youngest members of the department. We have the least amount of, no, that's not quite right, actually. Uh, we have little amount of overlap with Norm and Morris. And yet he got us to do this. And he also got us to say a few words here, which none of us wanted to do. Uh, keep it up, Danny. <laughs> I, uh, uh, Athulia will talk a little bit about the process that went into creating the installation. And I would like to invite all of you guys to, at some point at least, uh, check it out. I think overall it's okay. Uh, it's my opinion, <laughs> it's okay because it's an impossible task to uh, honor uh, Norman Morris in any adequate way, as you all know. Uh, but it's maybe worth seeing, and that's 
good enough. Um, I just wanted to say how proud, honored, and uh, privileged we feel to be part of the group of people who get to work in the footsteps of Norman Morris. Uh, in our case, we also get to occupy the offices that uh, they occupied, and it's a little bit silly almost to put this on such an important stage because in a way, the kind of work that we do does not or should not depend at all on where we do it. It's the nature of what we do is science. It's usually paper and pencil science. What does it matter where you sit down and think about things? It matters what colleagues you have. But of course it does matter uh, where you do the work in a very interesting way. At least to me, it seems that way. And it does so because, um, because we are humans. Uh, it's science is done by human beings and we have all kinds of you know, odd peculiarities inside of us that at some point maybe we wish we understand a little bit better. But one of those things uh, is that we find attachments and inspiration from people and the traces that they left behind in our lives. And Morris and Norm's traces in our lives are direct in many cases in terms of personal experiences, they're also indirect in terms of uh, the kinds of work that they created, which shaped the field, the kind of work that we were taught when we were students here, the kind of work that's being discussed everywhere in the department. Um, and seeing these ideas tied to almost attached physical things, photos of Norm when he was you know, in the 50s, that creates a way of connecting to people. And that's a carry of inspiration and that matters because it matters how we are inspired, what we do. And for us, it's an enormous, for me, it's, I should maybe say this for me, it's an enormous privilege to get to be inspired every day by knowing that where I get to work for a little bit is where Noam works, where, Noam, where Morris works, where all of you guys work, where we as a field get to carry on you know, their intellectual enterprise. It's an enormous privilege. So this is the culmination of an effort that was maybe a year long and Martin and I are really at the, the front end of a much broader enterprise. So I wanna take a moment to thank the people that were involved. Um, so first and foremost, Jen has really been the engine to this operation from the start to finish. So thank you so much. Thanks also to Mary. I don't think it would be an exaggeration for me to say that Mary is really the engine of this entire department. Thank you, Mary. Um, Emer Garland of the Institute Office of Communication has been integral to the logistical aspects of the project. Um, and if you guys have seen the wall, the reason that it looks as impressive as it does is because of the talents of our designer, Paul Monty, and the production team at Advanced Imaging. So thank you to them. Many people contributed content that is now on display at the wall and they are personal and all of them are fascinating. So thank you to Donka, to Michael, to David, Sabine, Enrico, Susan Fisher, Jim Harris, and the late Florence Harris. Thank you to Donka for providing us advice and guidance throughout various stages of this project. Um, Uh, in 2018, when it was first decided that the experimental labs were going to move to the, uh, the offices of Chomsky and Halley, David had the idea of having a dedication of that space to them, and Danny insisted on seeing that through, and this extremely well-deserved dedication wouldn't 
have existed were it not for the two of them. So thanks to you both. Okay, hey, so, oh, I have to say, it says Danny. <laughs> and so I, I actually wanted to, to, my thought was that I try to bring up some memories, thought that was appropriate. There were so many, so I did to select quite a bit, but want to share two. So, so here's one. Um, it's it's about something that happened in my maybe my first personal encounter with Morris was in the my first year it was at the bottom of building 20 I was trying to get candy from the machine there and, and Morris called me over can we have the slide thank you yeah and 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 what was still resonating in my mind is a comment he made in class when I couldn't answer a question of his on, I think I told some of you this, so I apologize, but I couldn't answer a question of his about Tiberian Hebrew and it's like, Fox, you're ignorant. And that's in the back of my mind. And, and he saw me and, and said with, with, this, with this huge smile, he, he said, listen, I, I told Norm you can't spell in English. You know what he said? He told me you can't spell in Hebrew either. <laughs> so, and, and, and the magical thing about this was that, that I wasn't offended. You know, I kind of laughed with him and was really just happy about the place I was at. You know, because he were these Two, two amazing people that I, like everyone else, was just amazed to be in the same room with. And, and, and they were able to joke about my shortcoming without it suggesting in any way that, that, I, that I was not valued. And, and that, that was something really unusual, I thought, you know. And, and, and really, <laughs> I think it was something magical about, about the place they created where, where the kind of conventional ways of valuing people that we were so used to somehow didn't apply. You might be ignorant, you might not know how to spell, but you could still be part of the conversation. And, and I don't know how Morris was able to convey this in, with, with those comments. You know, the smile was part of it, but, but it was just the magic. And, and, and this place they created was attracted kind of the quirkiest, liveliest people, most diverse group of people, and really like the, the smartest people that anyone could meet. And okay, so now's another. <laughs> So this happened in my fifth year as a student. And, and I remember seeing Norm and Morris uh, leaving the office. It was around 6.30 and they were going to the subway together. And I remember Morris saying, wait up and was carrying his very, very heavy backpack on. And, and I was saying to myself, how wonderful this simple picture was, you know, these two intellectual giants who had been together for, I'd say, 40 years and with the energy of, of high school buddies going to the subway. And kind of, if only there were smartphones then and I was smart enough to take a picture that would have made a great addition to the wall we have up there. But, you know, I should say it's a beautiful wall anyway, so yeah. So uh, that's it for now, and Norm's going to say a few words. Thank you. Well, I'll add a couple of words. Uh, Morris and I met in the fall of 1951, a couple weeks after I came to Cambridge. For me, it was the first time in my life that I'd been outside of Philadelphia. He had a much more complicated and interesting history. Uh, we were both 
grad students at Harvard. Morris had just gotten his first teaching appointment at MIT, part-time at RLE, which is where we met. Uh, as Jay pointed out, RLE was where the action was in the main areas of our common interests. We immediately became close friends and collaborators remained so for 65 years. Uh, when I joined MIT formally in 1955, we shared a small office at, at MIT at uh, RLE. Uh, tells you a little bit about what RLE was like at those days. Uh, a tiny little office. Uh, over the summer, it was almost uninhabitable. Couldn't barely breathe from the heat. So Morris decided we should see if we could get an air conditioner. Uh, but in order to get an air conditioner, you had to get permission from the uh, top, of, top bureaucracy. So we passed our request up to the guys who run buildings and finally got back an answer saying, you can't have an air conditioner because it doesn't fit with the decor of or of building 20. Well, you saw the picture of building 20, <laughs> but uh, we went ahead and put in the air conditioner anyway, just got somebody to do it for us. Nice to be in an engineering school. Well, that was our first place. Then uh, later on, we graduated to adjacent offices, finally our luxurious quarters at Stata, which a very far cry from where we started. In the late 1950s, Morris had a crazy idea. Came in one day and said, why don't we start a linguistics department? It really was crazy, if you think about it. Uh, first of all, there were almost no linguistics departments anywhere, a handful of them. It was a very small field. Everyone knew each other. It was also a field reaching closure. Basically, everything was done. Described itself as a taxonomic science, organized and arranged things, purely descriptive. It had a major principle the phonemic principle. Beyond that, it had careful procedures of analysis. Bernard Bloch's procedures of phonemic analysis, which Jay learned at Yale, uh, Zoe Harris's more extensive and sophisticated general procedures of analysis in his book, Methods of Structural Linguistics. I should say my own undergraduate education in linguistics was pretty much confined to proofreading Harris's methods in 1947 when it was completed. The procedures could apply to any collection of materials. They would yield a structural description. There were good elicitation techniques that you learned in field methods courses. There were no problems about acquisition that had all been settled. Acquisition was by training and habit. Uh, philosophers from Quine to Wittgenstein basically agreed. It was all basically consensus. So why a new linguistics department in a very small field that's reaching closure with no real problems anymore? And even if there was to be a linguistics department, why at MIT of all places? No language departments, no library resources, no humanities in those days, no psychology programs. MIT then was just beginning a transition from engineering school to a science-based university, which it has now become. Well, Nevertheless, we decided to go ahead with Morris's crazy idea. And just like 
the air conditioner. We submitted a proposal expecting pretty much the same kind of answer. Well, to our amazement, the proposal was accepted, sort of. Uh, by accident, just a couple of days ago, I received an actual transcript of the faculty meeting where it was approved. The faculty approved a doctoral program in uh, machine translation that would include some philology, uh, though it was understood that students would focus on computer applications and the philology would be in the background. Well, I don't remember whether Morris and I attended the faculty meeting. If so, we quickly suppressed it, just as we had suppressed the orders about the air conditioner. And we went on to establish a Department of Linguistics, though of a quite unconventional kind. Uh, luckily for us, we weren't alone. There were other really outstanding linguists at RLE who could join. Bob Lees, Ed Klima, Hugh Matthews, Joe Applegate, soon others. Well, we still faced a question. Why would any students come to a place like this? Pretty crazy choice if you were hoping for a professional career. Amazingly, they came. A remarkable group, each of whom, if you look back, left a major imprint on the field that was just being born and has now proliferated not only at MIT, but all over the world in ways that were completely unimaginable at that time and are still pretty hard to imagine when you think about what happened. Well, in later life, uh, Morris and I did think about it often, reminisced in the style of older folks. No false modesty. We felt we had accomplishments. In fact, one major accomplishment we felt, and I feel, is that we had helped to change the field from one where everything was known to a different field in which almost nothing is known. That's a major accomplishment. But we always felt that by far the greatest accomplishment was to establish this department, which has continued to flourish beyond our wildest dreams. I don't have to tell you how sorry I am that Morris is not with us to join in dedicating this new wing, which I have no doubt will be the home of exciting discoveries in the years to come. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. You welcome to stay, and I hope you do. Hi, everyone. Uh, the bar is still open, so help yourself, and there's plenty of food, too. Okay. Oh, yes, and if anybody would like to have a viewing of the uh, space upstairs, I'll be at the front where we register people in. So I'd be there and happy to take anybody up that wants to go. Okay.